On today's episode, we've got five key frog fishing tips to help you get ready for summer fishing. We have not one, but two news stories involving cheating in recent bass fishing tournaments, and we answer your fishing questions about the Yamamoto Yamatanuki, what to do with your old soft plastics, and how to minimize backlashes when learning to skip a bait caster. All that and more in this episode of Tackle Talk. This is the Tackle Talk Podcast, brought to you by American Legacy Fishing and Outdoors, Mossy Oak, Dakota Lithium, and Arctic Coolers. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Tackle Talk Podcast. We have a great show for you today, but first, we are brought to you by the great folks over at American Legacy Fishing. And the folks at ALF have been in our corner for years, helping us produce this show week in and week out, all while providing you, the listeners, with the best fishing gear at the best price, with the best service that you will find in the entire fishing industry. Whether you're looking for brand new rods and reels from Daiwa, G. Loomis, Shimano, Dobbins, 13, Abu Garcia, Fenwick, Megabass, Luz, Ducket, and more, or whether you want to grab some of your favorite lures from Berkeley, Beast Coast, Megabass, Strike King, Rapala, any of those, or maybe you're just looking to browse the internet's best selection of high quality, lightly used fishing rods and reels from your favorite brands, you should be checking AmericanLegacyFishing.com. They have a price match guarantee right there on the website in writing. They have a fantastic loyalty and reward program with the American Legacy Elite program, which gives you free shipping with no minimums and 10% back on every single order. And they have your favorite coupon code on the internet, TackleTalk10. That saves you 10% on almost everything on the website that's not already on sale or not one of the few exceptions that are out of their control. Everything else on that website, 10% off with code TackleTalk10 over at www.americanlegacyfishing.com, the first place you should check for your favorite fishing gear. Okay, everybody, to start off today's episode, we just hit a major milestone in the Tackle Talk world. We hit our four millionth download this past week across Apple, Spotify, all the major streaming services. So four million people have downloaded the Tackle Talk show. That is a big number to a small town guy like me. And I bring this up not to pat ourselves on the back, quite the opposite, to pat you on the back, the listeners. Each one of those four million times that someone started listening or downloading an episode that's you that's real people made the very real choice to spend an hour or 45 minutes with us and listen to us talk about what we love which is bass fishing so i'm most proud of the fact that those four million downloads are from people like you who actually want to learn who want to become better anglers who want to better themselves on the water we've built this show without drama without clickbait without rumor mill things or finger pointing or negativity or all of that stuff that seems so prevalent in the fishing industry today. We don't really do that here. Could we? Sure, we could. I guess we could, and we could probably have better numbers than we do now, but that's not the type of show that we want Tackle Talk to be. We want this to be a place where you can come and you can escape the noise and the drama for 30 to 60 minutes a week, and hopefully at the end of the show, you've taken something away from this that will help you be a better angler the next time you go out and fish out on the water. So again, just a massive thank you to each and every one of you. When we started this show, All I could see is numbers on a spreadsheet, but over the past, you know, four, four and a half years, I've got to meet so many of you at expos, at the Bassmaster Classic, at iCast, just out in daily life. I mean, we had an event at the stadium where I work for like my normal job, you know, down at the baseball field, and someone came down the stairs yesterday at the event was like, hey man, love the show, Tackle Talk rules, and like that right there is awesome. It's just, it it blows my mind that you guys want to listen to some dork sitting at a tiny desk in his little spare room talk to a microphone and a blank wall in front of me about fishing for like an hour a week so very blessed thank you guys so much but the reason I share this is because the success of this show is also your success right I believe in transparency I believe in keeping you guys in the know we are all in this sort of weird journey over the past four four and a half years together so I feel like you have the right to know there's no secrets here we just hit our four millionth download and we are still going strong 
Okay, everybody, next up here, no Bassmaster news, no Major League Fishing news since our last episode. That'll be coming in the next couple weeks as Major League Fishing starts their next event here soon, so competitive fishing results will be back in the coming weeks. But instead, unfortunately, in the world of bass fishing, we have some smaller circuits that are making some news and not in the best of ways. We recently had two more cheating scandals come through the bass fishing world. So we're not going to talk about these, obviously, to get people riled up or anything. It's just unfortunate that right we are a bass fishing show we cover bass fishing news and this unfortunately is the news right now so really quickly the first article here from wired to fish is titled cheater caught altering fish at sealy big bass splash and they say here sealy outdoors owner bob sealy and his son-in-law chris bennett have announced that an angler who competed in the big bass splash tournament over the weekend at toledo bend reservoir has been arrested bennett explained that the angler who was not named turned in a bass at the final weigh-in that was immediately flagged by the weight master. Bennett said the fish was set aside and an investigation revealed that the bass had lead weights inside of it to increase its weight. Agents determined that there was 2.59 pounds of lead used to illegally increase the fish's weight. We spoke with the Sabine Parish law enforcement and confirmed that the angler was arrested and charged with a felony for fraud. Fishing contest fraud brings up to a $3,000 fine and one year in jail. So that's story number one, right? Very reminiscent of the walleye cheating scandal that we had from a few years back, people stuffing fish full of weights and getting caught. And what blows my mind is the obnoxiousness of these people and the weight that they're stuffing in these fish. I mean, 2.6 pounds of lead is a lot of lead. Like you can look at that fish and you can say, no matter what that fish is, you know, fat wise, it should not be weighing that much. You can look at the length of that fish, the proportions of that fish, and you can just shake your head and go, that fish does not weigh that. It's the same thing with Jake and Chase and the walleye scandal. They were so egregious with the amount of weight that they were stuffing into these fish Anybody with half a brain would go, yeah, that fish should not weigh that. Let's check that. So I'm glad the jerks were caught, obviously. I'm glad the boys in blue were there to arrest them, give them the charge of felony fraud, and hopefully they learn their lesson. And then the second story here we have is from an even smaller tournament, but just as egregious as the first, mainly because of the way the dude was caught red-handed. So the second article is titled, Angler Caught Cheating in Illinois Bass Tournament. And it says, a tug engineer stepped outside for a smoke break Friday evening and witnessed a boat doing something suspicious. An engineer who goes by the name of Joe noticed a boat who was stringing up fish to the side of a barge slip. Being a fisherman, he knew something was up. He quickly assumed the worst and began to film the incident. Joe was suspicious the men were planning on cheating in a fishing tournament, so he googled to see if there were any in the area. He came to find that there was a Cal Sag Bass Anglers tournament the coming Saturday. Being from Alabama, Joe was unsure who to contact, so he called the local conservation police and notified them of what he saw. Joe was there the following morning and watched as the angler retrieved the fish around 4.45 that morning. Once again, he got the incident on camera. Come time for weigh-in, the anglers arrived at Waterfront Bar and Grill in suburban Burnham with their catch, only to find conservation police officers awaiting their arrival. The cheaters were quickly confronted and banned from all future CalSAG bass anglers and Big Lake bass anglers tournaments. Along with the blatant videos of cheating, the anglers were on the water during an off-limits period where anglers weren't allowed to be on the lake. Local anglers were infuriated, yet glad to see the men get what they deserved. While the angler had not been charged yet, he will be. The CPOs stayed throughout the tournament weigh-in to ensure that the anglers weren't harmed. However, the following charges will largely depend on the Illinois Department of Natural Resources legal department. Joe Zener, a 70-year-old angler, ended up winning the event with 15.16 pounds, earning 1000 $372. Okay, so we have a little bit more information on this one from what I've been sent and what people have kind of uh, DM'd me or emailed me over the past probably week or so. So I've got the actual video that the tug engineer took on his phone. It's a little blurry, but you can see exactly what the dude is doing. It's some schlub who caught some decent fish, and then you can see him putting them on a stringer and then tying them to the barge slip. So the video is not a great look for the guy. Obviously, they said charges could be coming. There's all of that stuff, but the video does not look good. And in a statement on Facebook from the Cal Sag Bass Anglers, they say on May 11th, 2024, Cal Sag Bass Angler, and then it's got his name. I won't reveal his name. 
of, and then it says his hometown, was stopped by Illinois Conservation Police during Cal Sag Bass Anglers Tournament as he arrived to weigh in his fish. His catch was confiscated and an investigation is pending. The gentleman's name, right here, obviously we're going to blur that out, is forever banned from participating in any Cal Sag or Big Lake Bass Anglers events or any of its affiliated events. So there you go. There you have it. There's some positivity, I guess, in these two stories is that both of them were caught. And it just goes to show that the tug engineer did what he should do. If you see something, say something. This sport, bass fishing in general, revolves around a lot of integrity. There's a lot of room for people to bend or break the rules when nobody's looking. And I think we can all agree that the bass fishing world is a lot better place when those rules are enforced and when everybody is on the same playing field to ensure that everyone has a fair shot. All right, everybody. Next up here, we have what we're going to probably call the main portion of today's episode, the topic that's probably the title of this episode, the topic that we really wanted to get to this week because of the time of year. So I realized that it's been a while since we've spent some time on what could quite possibly be the most fun way to catch bass, and we are entering prime time for it, and it's frog fishing. So, I mean, a few weeks ago, we saw, right, Jordan Lee absolutely violate fish down on the Kissimmee chain on a frog, and most of the country is either in prime frog time or they're entering prime frog time and it's just going to keep getting better so i'm not sure if there is anything else in the world better than throwing a hollow body frog on a mat or onto pads or weeds working it along and then an aquatic vacuum cleaner just comes up and engulfs this poor frog because those next two to three seconds are what we live for as anglers that moment between the actual bite itself which breaks that intense sort of tension of waiting for a strike and then that couple seconds where your brain switches over and says now it's time to set the hook Look, that right there, that two to three seconds where you make that switch is a drug unlike anything else on the face of the earth. And today, we're hopefully going to give you some tips that will help you experience that euphoria a little bit more often. So today, we have five key frog fishing tips to help you catch more frog fish this late spring and into summer. And there's obviously way more tips that we can go through that you can seek out on your own. Like I say, I always encourage people, go find other sources of information too. Don't just listen to this show. Go watch other shows other YouTube channels, read articles, broaden that horizon and that knowledge base because the tips I give you might not be the tips that the other guys give you or the other gals give you or, you know, the article or legacy sort of media that we have in fishing like in Fisherman or Bassmaster or someone like that. They might give you different tips. So go out, seek out as much information as you can. Go find those YouTube videos, those articles, those podcast episodes. But this is going to be our down and dirty five tips for frog fishing in 2024. Okay, so the number one tip here for frog fishing this year is one that you're going to want to consider before you even head out on the water, and it's going to be that when you're frog fishing, more so than any other technique that I think I ever use, the right gear is crucial to your success. So many other techniques you can get away with, you know, two or three different power rods. You can get away with, you know, almost any reel. It'll technically do the job in most situations. Line choice can be subjective. There's a lot of gray area in different options that you can use, whether it be personal preference or, you know, experience or confidence or whatever it is. You can get by with different gear for the same situations with a lot of different techniques. Like, for instance, I throw a popper on a medium fast spinning rod. And then when we had Rick Clunt on the show years back, he said that he uses a seven foot heavy casting rod. Those are polar opposite rods, right? I have a wimpy little seven foot medium fast, just, you know, flimsy spinning rod. And then he's got a meat stick of a seven foot heavy casting rod. And neither of those are wrong, right? It's just an opinion. It's just personal taste. It's the same thing with like a chatterbait, right? Some people really like a more moderate parabolic bend to that rod where others want a stout fast rod. Again, no wrong answers there. It's just your opinion. It's just what you like and what you feel comfortable with but ladies and gentlemen with frog fishing there is gear that is right and then there is gear that is wrong if you're fishing a frog the traditional way if you're around weeds if you're around vegetation the right gear is rarely up for discussion so 
what do you need, right? What are we talking about when we say the right gear for frog fishing? Well, you're going to need a very heavy, very fast meat stick of a rod. You're going to need the fastest bait casting reel that you own, and you're going to need very heavy braided line. Those are the three things that you should have before you even make a cast with a frog. So why, right? Why is that the only gear that really makes sense to use? Well, for all three, you're fishing like the worst conditions possible for an angler in terms of leverage over the fish. The fish has the advantage when you're frog fishing. If it eats that frog amid all of these weeds and pads and obstructions in the water that can create issues for that strong, stable connection between you and the fish. It can wrap you around pad stems. It can get caught in three pounds of grass. It's not this clean catch like most of your techniques are, which means you need the beefiest gear that you can find. So that means a heavy rod because a heavy rod allows you to set the hook with authority regardless of the conditions. You can set the hook like you mean it. You can give them the beans as someone might say, right? You are in control from start to finish because you know that rod is not going to fail you you can wail on that rod as much as you want you can put as much pressure on that rod you're not babying it in any situation from start to finish from the cast to landing that fish so the next thing is the reel right you also want to have a reel that can pick up line fast enough during the fight that you never let that fish have any slack that should be your goal when you're frog fishing that line should be as tight as possible the entire fight no exceptions there's no drag here there's no getting cute with anything it is you versus the fish and you have to be stronger than the fish part of that is you part of that is your gear and then there's the line and the second that you have stretch in your line when you're frog fishing you lose right plain and simple if you have stretch on the hook set you lose if you have stretch during the fight you lose. Don't make that mistake. In my opinion, mono and fluoro have no place in frog fishing. This is a straight braid technique, and we're talking anywhere from 50 pound to 65 pound braid. Now, the main difference to consider when picking up one of those two is casting distance. So if you're making normal casts, right, I would say probably like 80% of what you're doing from either the bank, a kayak, a boat, whatever, 65 pound is my favorite. You don't have to worry about anything. You can horse that fish as much as you want. It might be a little overkill, but you just take line completely out of the equation. The only time that you might switch to something lighter than 65 would be if I need like extra casting distance. If I'm standing on the bank and the place that I need to hit is like a bajillion miles away and I need to bomb that frog as physically far as possible, you can go down to something like 50 pound and you're going to get extra casting distance going from 65 to 50. That's just plain honest truth. So if you go down to 50, that's fine. I would never, at least for me personally, I would never go below 50. 50 pound between 50 and 65 is that sweet spot i like 65 some people like 50 whatever is fine but i probably wouldn't go below that So that's tip number one, right? You need to have the right gear. Frog fishing is the off-road mudding of bass fishing, right? And when you go off-roading or you go mudding, you don't take a PT Cruiser or, you know, a Honda Civic or something. You take the 632 big block Chevy or whatever you got, right? You take the big jacked up truck because that's what can handle it. It's the same thing with fishing gear and frogging. You need the stronger, beefier gear to effectively land those fish. So that's tip number one for frog fishing. The right gear is critical. All right, everybody, we'll get back to the episode here in just a second. But first, we are brought to you in part by Mossy Oak. And there's a reason that you're going to see some of the best anglers on the planet wearing Mossy Oak fishing apparel. I'm talking Kevin Van Dam, Hank Parker, Ott Defoe, Greg Hackney, Brandon Polinick, Gerald Swindle, Jordan Lee, All those guys wear Mossy Oak. That's because while it's true that Mossy Oak makes some of the best hunting apparel on the planet, they also have an incredible fishing apparel line designed for those tough days on the water. And we're getting to that time of year where the sun is going to be a real concern. I've had days where I've been out on the water for like 12 hours straight. I feel fine and then I come home and I look like a lobster because I didn't take care of my skin all day. Don't be that person. Dress for the elements. Trust me, you'll thank me later. That's why you should check out Mossy Oak Fishing 
Springs Tech shirts. They're lightweight, they're breathable, and they still protect you from the sun and reduce sweat. With options from short sleeve to long sleeve, long sleeve tech hoodies, and more, they're exactly what you need to stay comfortable and protected out there on the water and look good doing it. So head over to www.store.mossyoak.com and click fishing at the top of the page. Again, that's www.store.mossyoak.com. Okay, now the number two tip for frog fishing here is going to be another one that I think you should do before you even make a cast, and that's trim the legs on your frog accordingly. So this tip can be a little different from frog to frog, obviously, because not all frogs are created equal. Some frogs are going to have shorter legs out of the package. Some are going to have longer legs out of the package. Some have different material. But my easy rule of thumb is that I like my frog legs to be about the length of my pinky finger. So from basically where it meets my hand to the tip of my finger, obviously everybody has different sized hands, so I know that's not like a universal thing, but I like the size of my finger as a nice constant to use for my frog legs. So the thing that I'll do is I will trim that first frog leg right there. It usually takes like, you know, maybe an inch or so off of the stock legs somewhere around there. Again, all frogs are a little different. So you've got some of these frogs that come in with like four inch, five inch legs. That's too much for me. So you cut and you trim that first leg. Now here's the thing. Don't do them both. Just do the first leg. And then the second leg, you're actually going to cut about a quarter inch shorter than the leg you just cut. So yes, your frog is going to have uneven legs. Does it look silly? I don't know, maybe to you, but there's a very real reason why we're going to do that. I think it helps me walk that frog back and forth a little easier than if they're the same length. It's just something that I've always been told to do since I was a kid. I've just done it without questioning it, and I walk frogs fine. So it could be a confidence thing, but I always stagger the legs on my frogs so that one is a little bit longer than the other, so I don't have to work as hard to work that frog back and forth as I'm walking it. You know, bam, 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 bam. That's what we mean when we say walking lure. I know most of you obviously know that, but if you don't know, it's that side to side kind of like V action that you see like a spook have or something like that. Sometimes you want your frog to do that too. Staggering the legs on my frogs helps it just walk back and forth a little bit easier. But the other reason that you're going to want to trim your skirt legs no matter what is to avoid those short strikes as much as possible. Shortening those legs gives your frog a more compact profile so that you don't have a fish just grabbing the legs as often and not getting the hooks. There is nothing worse than having a fish take down your frog you set the hook and there is absolutely nothing there like no pressure nothing it's not like you felt it for a second and you just didn't get hook penetration it was just never there those are those short strikes that are infuriating so shrinking the target that that fish has to aim for by shortening those legs helps ensure that a fish is eating the whole frog and actually getting the hooks so that's tip number two here for frog tips this year is trim your frog legs and stagger them cut the second one about a quarter inch shorter and you'll have a little easier time walking that frog back and forth. All right, tip number three here for frog fishing is going to be something that helped me catch so many fish since I started doing it a few years ago, and I think it's something that's easy to overlook or to forget, and it's to make sure to slow down or pause your retrieve when that frog hits a more open area in the vegetation. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's say you cast your frog out onto a grass mat, and that grass mat has like 95% coverage over the area, but then there are a few small openings Say they're like the size of a dinner plate or something where the grass and that mat is just a little bit thinner or you can see the water under it and it's just like a hole in the mat. Well, cast your frog way past that and then slowly work your frog toward that opening that you see. And then here's the big one. Once that frog crosses that threshold from the grass mat to that small opening, kill it. Work, 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 right? You're working it toward that little hole. And then the second that it hits open water or that it hits that light spot, pause. Because that moment right there can be deadly. Because what seems to happen, or at least what I think is happening, is that a fish could be under that mat tracking that frog as it moves. So it's seeing, you know, that frog kind of indent the mat as it's going across. And it's just sort of following it, seeing what's going on. It's not ready to fully commit and just completely crash through that grass mat. But it's seeing what's going on. It's kind of tracking its prey a little bit there. And then the second that it sees a frog hit the actual open water, it sees 
legs. It sees a belly. It doesn't just see that shadow above the grass mat that's still kind of protected by the mat, and then it goes into open water, leaving it vulnerable. That's when those bass seem to strike a lot of times. So milk that moment. Don't just blow past that open spot. Let that frog make its way from the weeds to that open water spot and then pause. And that pause can be the difference between nothing at all or an absolutely rated R for blood and gore strike on that poor hollow body frog. And even if it's not on the actual pause when you get hit, maybe it's the next really small twitch while it's in the open water that triggers that fish. So that next three to five seconds where it hits that open water is crucial and don't overlook it. So there's tip number three. It's a simple one, but a deadly one. Make sure to pause your frog when you cross the threshold from grass to water before continuing your retrieve like normal. All right, tip number four here for frog fishing this week is going to be squeeze your frog dry as often as possible. So for those of you that throw frogs a lot, especially what we'll call well-loved frogs, right, frogs that have seen a fish or two, they tend to wear out and just let a tad bit more water inside the frog than originally intended when they first came out of the package. So that water comes in through like where the line tie is. It can come through where the back legs poke out. These spots that used to be fairly protected from water entering the frog, they just kind of wear out over time. That's just sort of the nature of a soft plastic frog, right? It's not going to always be this durable machine that it was when it came out of the package. And that means that a lot more water ends up inside your frog after every cast, the older that frog gets or after every fish that you catch. The one thing that you always want to do is make sure that there is as little water in that frog as possible because you want that frog to collapse as easily easy as it can when it gets hit. You don't want any little bit of resistance from that frog to collapse and expose those hooks to that fish's mouth. So it may not seem like much, but if there's water inside that frog, obviously it takes more pressure to push out water and compress that frog than it does just to collapse if there's only air inside. So this is why when you fish with me and I'm out there fishing a frog, I squeeze that frog a lot, almost after every cast, just to make sure that I'm squirting out all the water that's inside that frog. Some frogs are better than others about not letting water in in general. So something like a Spro bronze eye frog, for instance, is probably going to let less water in than something like a Booyah pad crasher. A pad crasher is a little softer of a frog where something like a Spro bronze eye is a little bit firmer. So those are things to consider too. But what I would not do is super glue some of those exit points shut to try and keep water out. I've seen guys do that a lot. They put super glue around the line tie to help keep water out well yeah right you can do that and you'll probably be closing off a spot for water to get in a little easier you're also super gluing shut one of the places for air to exit that frog so it's not going to collapse as easy regardless so again the easier your frog collapses the better hookup rates you're typically going to get it's just common sense so that's tip number four here squeeze your frog often to make sure that you're starting out your cast with no no water inside it. Okay, and our last tip here, tip number five for frog fishing today is the ever important three second rule. It's probably been a few years since we've talked about the three second rule, so we're long overdue for it here. When I started frog fishing, my biggest mistake by far was setting the hook too early. And it's a natural response, right? You're out there throwing this frog, you're anxious for a blow up and you're waiting and there's so much anticipation that builds up. It can be such a long time in between blow ups that when you finally do get a blow up, it's just like almost second nature where you want to immediately rear back and set the hook. With frog fishing, that's generally not the move, right? You don't want to set the hook the second that you see a blow up, even though your instincts tell you to do it. Instead, wait a few seconds before you crack that fish into next century you cast you work that frog and then boom blow up your frog disappears and you just go one two three boom and you set the hook and what you're doing right there is you're letting that fish get the whole frog in its mouth so you might be saying but andrew what if it spits it out Well, I guess technically that could be a possibility, but think about it, right? If you're a bass and you exert that much effort to eat something, you're going to want to make sure that you get a good chance at it. You're not going to exert 
all of that effort, more effort than you've exerted in days for a meal, just to let it go the millisecond that it hits your mouth, you're not going to do that. You worked hard for that frog. If you strike it and you try and kill it, but you maybe only get half of the frog in your mouth, you can bet your tail that you're going to give another gulp there to get that whole frog in your mouth immediately. So give that fish a chance to get that whole frog in its mouth. Wait a second. One, two, three, set the hook. That's it. That's all it takes. No Mississippis, no making it harder than it needs to be. One, two, three. Half the time, I still say it out loud to this day to remind myself on those days where I'm a little trigger happy. One, two, three. That's all you got to do. Three seconds can make the difference between you swinging too fast on that fish and you get nothing or a picture perfect hook set and a great catch. So there are your five tips for frog fishing today to help you with some grade A days on the water this year, hopefully. And while some of these may not have been earth shattering, you know, never before heard tips, these are five tips that you need to remember. We need to constantly be reminded of these for great frog fishing days on the water. So tip number one, the right gear is crucial heavy rods fast reels heavy braided line number two don't forget to trim the legs on your frogs even staggering them if you choose tip number three pause or slow down at those openings in vegetation tip number four make sure to squeeze your frogs often to keep the water out of them every time you cast and then number five abide by the three second rule for hook sets So if you do those five things, I think you will be much better off than if you don't do those five things. So I hope that helps everybody have a few more great frog fishing days here on the water in the coming months as we get into summer. All right, everybody. And finally here, we are going to get into the mailbag powered by Dakota Lithium. All right, everybody, we are back for another installment of the mailbag powered by Dakota Lithium. The first question here is from Nathan Gannon, and he says, hey, Andrew, love the podcast, especially the musky diet episode. Odd question here. How do you get rid of packs of plastics that you don't want anymore, such as plastics that you tried out one or two in the bag and didn't like, or maybe you just hoarded way too many plastics that you'll never actually use and need to minimize down the stuff that you actually have? Uh, Nathan, that is a great question. Thanks for the question. I'm glad you enjoyed the episode on the diet studies with Camden. It was one of my favorite ones we've done in a while, too, so I'm glad you enjoyed that. But your question is about old soft plastics. What do you do with your old soft plastics that you're not using anymore? And that is a problem we all have. We buy these things like when they're on sale. You know, I'm walking through somewhere. There's a deal that's too good to be true. Maybe you want to try something new you've never tried before, and then you get them, and for one reason or another, you don't like them, or you just don't end up using them. Using the whole pack. My problem usually is that I'm just a sucker for a good sale and I see something with a lower price and my redneck brain goes, you got to buy that before the price goes up. But I should be on the other side of my shoulder saying, uh, but Andrew, it doesn't matter what price it is. You're not going to use it. And then the other devil on my shoulder is like, but it's a dollar off. So I'm in the same boat there, right? We all do that. So your question is, what should you do with those old soft plastics? Well, I would say there's two things that you can do with those. The first is going to be donate them right give them to someone who will use them find someone at your local pond your local lake your river and just give them to somebody especially if they have kids or they have kids with them a little act of kindness like that goes such a long way you could make somebody's day by giving them those baits that you don't even want anymore right there's something that you might have just thrown away but instead don't overlook the power of putting those soft plastics in someone else's hands that will appreciate them you'll feel a lot better better for two reasons. One, you cleaned out space in your tackle stash, and two, you did a good deed that made somebody's day and made them smile. So that's option number one, right? You can go out there and you can find a better use for it. Maybe there's somewhere in your area that takes donations and gives them out to, you know, underprivileged kids or something, but donate them some way, somehow. Now, option number two is to melt down those soft plastics into something that you do actually want to use. And all that takes is a little injection mold, a little, you know, tube shooter thing you can get online, and then an old microwave. That's it. And I still do this to this day, and I am uh, not proud to admit what I'm about to say because I really like the people that make the originals, but I bought some bootleg molds off the internet a couple years ago, and that's what I use to remelt my soft plastics into. So I bought an exact copy of a Rage Crawl mold, I bought an exact copy of a Rage Menace mold, and then I bought an exact copy of a Berkeley Pit Boss mold. 
100% accurate, exact copies. I'm sure it's illegal for these people to be making them. And trust me, I respect the craft. I appreciate what these people are doing. But also, I'm a regular dude and a consumer that just likes to save money. So I decided that I was going to buy these bootleg molds off eBay. And then when I do buy a pack of soft plastics or something that I try and I don't like, well, I didn't waste my money because I'm just going to turn those into rage crawls or pit bosses. So it's a win win. So you just take those old soft plastics, you put them in a microwave safe container, and then you melt those soft plastics in the microwave. You take your little injector, you suck it up in there, right? And then you shoot it in that mold and boom, brand new rage crawls, brand new pit bosses instead of throwing away those soft plastics. So ethically, is it the right thing to do? I don't know, right? Probably not with patented designs and, you know, someone else's designs, but I don't make them obviously to like resell or give people or anything. They're just for personal use so that I'm not throwing away soft plastics that I spent money on. So I don't see much harm in it, but even if you went out and you just got some generic molds from Do It or someone like that, right, it would be a great use of your old soft plastics versus them just sitting around. You get the chance to be creative, to mix colors, to try new things, and to recycle to make sure that you're not wasting money. Now, the only thing to watch is that some soft plastics remelt better than others, but you can usually get away with that by, you know, playing with some of the microwave times. There's, you know, like uh, conditioners and softeners and stuff you can put in there as well. Uh, Mixing some different brands work a little bit better than others. Getting real creative with it and kind of trial and error. So those would be my two recommendations, right? You can either donate your old soft plastics or you can remelt them into new soft plastics. All right, everybody, we'll get back to the episode here in just a second, but first we are brought to you in part by Dakota Lithium Batteries. And boys and girls, there are just certain things that you want to take out of the equation when you're on the water. Things that you don't want to have to worry about, they should just work when they're needed and never let you down. Things you just want to buy and never have to think about again, like a life jacket or a net. Well, I would argue that one of the most important items that falls into that category is your battery. And I can confidently say that after years of running Dakota Lithium Batteries, that's exactly what they do. They work when you need them to every single time. And they're just one of those things that you make the right purchase the first time, and then you don't have to worry about it seemingly ever again, and you can focus on what you should be focused on, which is fishing. So if you want your own Dakota Lithium batteries, all you have to do is go to www.dakotalithium.com, and even better, you don't have to pay full retail price. That's because you're smart, you listen to Tackle Talk, and we're here to save you money. The boys at Dakota Lithium have gave us the code Tackle Talk. 10. Tackle Talk 10 saves you 10% off your entire battery purchase every single time. Again, that's code Tackle Talk 10 over at www.dakotalithium.com, the official lithium battery of Bassmaster. All right, the next question is from Mark Bordeaux, and he says, Hi, Andrew. I just ordered a shirt, and I'm very excited for it. Thanks. I've been fishing a dammed up river and always have a hard time finding fish. The thing is, it's not highly pressured. Is it better to fish the top of the dam where it's more like a pond with weeds, it's deeper, muck bottom, less flowing water, or move up river to the next dam where it's more like a river with flowing water and a rocky bottom? I know there's a lot to unfold here, but I'm looking for some pointers. Thanks, Mark. Well, hey, Mark. Uh, Yeah, thanks for writing in. I appreciate it. And thanks for ordering a shirt that just went out. I actually remember the name. So it did go out about a day or two ago. You should be getting it pretty soon. So thank you for that. As far as your situation goes, I personally would move upstream if it were me toward the next dam where there's more current. I just think that current breathes life into an ecosystem more so than like a dammed up stagnant part of the river, right? Around here, we have both of those. We have very stagnant areas that will hold fish, and to be honest, they probably hold some of the biggest fish in the entire river system, but they're tougher areas to fish. There's way more to break down. There's way less rhyme or reason as to where fish are at certain times and trying to find them. They're just a little less predictable, where on the flip side, if you go to where there's more current, yeah, maybe you're average size of fish changes a little bit there, but fish are generally more active, they're more aggressive, and they're easier to pattern in that current. So I know you said there's a lot to unpack there, but I think the choice here for me is pretty simple. I would go upstream, I would look for big current seams, eddies, riffles, anything where there's some sort of rhyme or reason as to where those fish could be sitting in relation to the current, and then you start right there and you pick it apart. 
Uh, the next question here is from Aaron Chatterton, and he says, no question, just a comment. I just finished up yesterday's episode and had another tip regarding someone's question about learning to skip a bait caster. Make a nice long cast, and while the line is out, put a piece of tape on your spool to cover the rest of your line. Then go about practicing skipping. When you inevitably blow up your reel over and over again until you get the hang of it, the tape stops the backlash from being bad enough, and you can get it right back out. A buddy recommended this to me while I was learning, and it was super helpful for me, so I just figured I'd pay it forward. Keep up the good work. You're doing it right. Tackle Talk always jumps to the top of my podcast list every Tuesday. Uh, Thanks, Aaron. I appreciate it, man. This is a really cool thing. This is like what I love about having more of an interactive show in the mailbag and having a place where you guys can submit, you know, questions and, you know, comments and things like that online on our website is that I'm always learning just like you guys are. So this is a great idea, right? I've never thought of this before. I've never done it, but I could definitely see it helping. And the reason that I could see it helping is because we used to put tape and I still do sometimes put tape over the knot that connects your backing to your main line when you're spooling up a bait caster so you put your old mono on there and then you tie a double uni or whatever it is and you put a piece of tape over that so that way if you ever get close to that knot you don't get that thing where you know your knot starts to like stop your reel from wanting to cast and your line gets caught in that knot and in the little tag ends and stuff so I used to put a piece of tape over that so that I never have that issue that makes sense to me so I could also see doing the same thing at the very tail end of my cast while I'm learning to skip to make sure that I don't ever you know kind of blow up my my reel to the point where, oh my gosh, I have to cut out all of this line now. Even if you just catastrophically blow up your reel at this point, if you have that piece of tape back there, like Aaron said, you're only going to have to cut out one cast's worth of line. You're not going to have to cut out the whole darn thing. So this is a great idea. If you're learning to skip, take Aaron's advice. Put some tape on that spool at the end of your cast to keep yourself from wasting a ton of line. Very cool tip, Aaron. I'm glad you wrote that in. Thank you so much. I'm going to have to try that sometime. Uh, The next question here is from Jake Woods, and he says, Hey, Andrew, I just found your podcast a few weeks ago, and I've been binging it while I'm at work. Appreciate the quality content and information without all the fluff. Fellow Midwesterner here from Missouri, and the struggle for slobs is real in our part of the country. I mostly fish highly pressured residential ponds, lakes, parks like a lot of us from around the area. I'm a sucker for jigs and soft plastics and recently came across a bait that I believe blends the two areas very well, the Yamatanuki. I've only fished it for a few weeks, but I really feel like I've gotten more bites and landed more fish in the usual lakes and ponds. I think it's quickly becoming a staple in my bag, and I'm not through all of your older episodes yet, but I don't think I've ever heard you mention it before. Just wondering if you've ever fished it and what your opinions are on it. Kind of a side note here, I haven't tried it yet, but I think the smaller 2.5 size on a stand-up jig head could be a fun option as well. Kind of like a big Ned rig. Appreciate the podcast and all the work you put into it. Give them the beans. Uh, thanks, man. Jake, I appreciate it. Always good to hear from a fellow Midwesterner that knows the struggle. You know it's tough out here, man. We're out here just trying to catch some fish, right? I got the chance to go up to like New York a couple weeks ago, and I got sort of a taste of what some of these other people have in terms of beautiful lakes, beautiful water, all that kind of stuff. And I was like, man, the Midwest is really tough. Like It's kind of all I've known, so we talk about it on the show sometimes. But yeah, when you actually get the chance to travel, you're like, oh, you know, Ohio, Illinois, Indiana, places places like that. Not the best places for bass fishing. Um, But I can relate to your question here too. It's funny you mentioned this. You specifically mentioned the Yamatanuki. And it's hilarious that you mentioned that exact bait because I am not kidding. I got a text from my buddy Jeff today that basically said, dude, I just had the best day ever on. And then he said the name of the lake. I'm not going to say the name of the lake because we don't spot burn on this show. But it's safe to say it's a local lake. Jeff and I both grew up fishing very often and it is notoriously one of the worst lakes in the area and I said no way not a chance right it's beginning of June it's hot as heck outside it was a bluebird sky sunny day not a great recipe for this already terrible lake and he said yeah man I caught more fish and better fish than I ever have in one single day and I was throwing this new bait I got called the Yamatanuki from Yamamoto and I said you were throwing like a stubby little poop bait basically because that's what a Yamatanuki is and he said yep 
I was throwing it weightless, and the plastic is dense enough on its own that I could fish it slow, and he said slow with like 86 O's in it, and then he said I could fish it in the rocks, and it was completely and entirely snagless, and the fish held on longer because there was no weight, and that's what he texted me. So to your point, Jake, I think there's probably something special with that bait that warrants an episode on it sooner, at least a little bit deeper of a dive, and I was going to do one anyway because after Jeff and I talked, I you know respect and you know appreciate Jeff's opinion on a lot of things. He's one of those people that I do trust what he says. So when he said there was something special about it, I was like, all right, I probably have to give this a try. Um, I did stay away from the Yamatsunuki because it seemed a little gimmicky, but when you blast fish on this particular lake that is not known for turning out good fish, well, I'm going to have to do a little bit more investigation on this bait. So rest assured, we will be talking about the Yamatanuki in some sort of episode in some fashion sometime soon. And then the last question here is from Javi Kawali. I'm sorry, I know I probably butchered that. I'm sorry, Javi, but I think I got the first name right at least. Um, He says, hi, Andrew. My name is Javi, and I'm a 12-year-old angler living in New York. I listen to your show a lot, and your tips are great. However, my ponds, creeks, and lakes are pretty pressured and filled with gunk, and it seems like all the fish are either really smart, have been caught already, or are non-existent. My family does not happen to own a $100,000 boat with $5,000 worth of electronics on it so i'm restricted to the bank my question is how would you find fish in murky junk filled water and which would help me get to the spots better a kayak or waders thanks for the podcast javi uh hey javi i hear you buddy listen this is right up my alley one my family didn't have a one hundred thousand dollar boat with five thousand dollars worth of electronics on it either we were just like you right balling on a budget you might say compared to some other folks but i'm glad that we never had that stuff because the necessity of the majority of the fishing that i grew up doing coming from cheap spinning rods you know some walmart tackle and a bike to get where i needed to go made me learn to fish a different way than a lot of my friends friends learned that grew up a little bit, you know, more on like big lakes with big boats and things like that. Because of it, I have small water experience that my friends just don't have, right? I know how small water can hold big fish. I know how they relate to current structure and tree lines and things like that because I got to see it on a micro scale where you could actually see the whole water system at once because you could throw a rock across it. It was so small and shallow. So there's a lot to be said for what you and I both do. I wouldn't trade it for anything. I really mean that. I wouldn't trade my waders for a nitro and I, I I promise you right that sounds silly but it's 100% true if you made me pick between the two between wading and kayaking or owning a very nice boat I would pick wading and kayaking every single time I would rather walk four to five miles in the water with the fish maneuvering through the terrain you know exploring you know versus going down some state park lake at 60 mile an hour or whatever that's not my speed I like the satisfaction that I get when I get to wade or I get to go on a big kayak trip. I think that's much more rewarding to me. So that's one side of your question, but you ask specifically, how would you fish murky, junk-filled water, and which of these would get you to spots better, a kayak or waders? So that question, I think, depends on the average depth of the water you're fishing. If you're around creeks and rivers that don't go above your head and you can wade them, I prefer wading. Like I said, I like to be in the water. Now, yes, you get in some gross situations, right? Like, you know, around here, we have junky, gross water, too. I mean, that is literally the name of the game around Dayton, Ohio. You're dodging trash. You're dodging, you know, dead animals. I mean, it seems like they find an actual human body in the river at least once a month at this point. You're dodging needles. You know, it's not the cleanest place in the world, obviously. It is really sad to see. But I think you learn so much more about the ecosystem and about the fish behaviors by being in the water with them. I know where every drop off is because I feel them. I know where every undercut bank is because I walk them. I know where every log, every transition, every shopping cart, every boulder, everything is in that river because I know where they're at because I've been in the water with them and I can remember them. So the only thing I'm going to say here though is you said that you're 12 years old. So my only advice or I guess plea to you would be don't go alone. Safety first, 
Don't go in dangerous areas. Don't go in dangerous water. Don't go in fast current. Don't go alone. Wear a life jacket if you can. That's always a great idea, even if you're waiting. Just one of those ones, not even an inflatable one, just one just in case for some reason you get in over your head or you take one step and there's a hole there that you didn't know. Just get one of those cheap, you know, like uh, non-inflatable ones and just wear it. That way you're just safe. But if you wade, do it safely. Start in very, very shallow creeks. I'm talking like hip deep and less. There are plenty of awesome fish in those type of places with very little risk to you actually getting hurt if you're careful. Now, if you're talking like ponds, lakes, things like that, a kayak is going to be the way to go. But again, do it with someone else, a parent, a friend, wear your life jacket, tell someone where you are. Trust me, I remember what I was like when I was 12 years old, and you want to make sure that safety is your number one concern. But yeah, kayaking and wading are both amazing. I think it just depends on what conditions you're around, what your actual creeks and rivers and lakes and stuff are like depth-wise. But yeah, I would much rather have you know a kayak and a pair of waders than a $100,000 boat any day. So that is today's episode, everybody. Thank you guys so much for listening. I appreciate each and every one of you that takes the time to tune in every week. Find us on the internet, tackletalkpodcast.com. You can submit your own mailbag question there for your chance to be heard on an upcoming episode. Shoot us an email, tackletalkpodcast at gmail.com. We're on Facebook, we're on Instagram, YouTube, at Tackle Talk Podcast. And we'll see you right back here next Tuesday for another brand new episode of Tackle Talk. Thank you for watching. For more, please subscribe to the Tackle Talk podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Amazon, or wherever you listen to podcasts.